I'm going to move on to introduce our speaker today, who is Professor Mark Wynne, the Noloth Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the University of Oxford in Oriel College. We're really grateful to have Mark come up and visit us today. He's a fantastic speaker and one of the foremost uh, philosophical theologians and philosophers of religion in Great Britain today. So we're really excited to hear what he has to say to us. And we're very grateful for him to come here and talk to us about Eucharistic, Eucharistic practice and the Christian life. Eucharistic practice being the, one of the focuses of uh, Christian worship. So we're really excited about this important topic and look forward to learning from Professor Mark Quinn. Thank you, Mark, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Martin, for the introduction. Am I standing in the right place to be seen and to be heard? This looks plausible, is it? Yes, great, thank you, Kelly. Um, can I just begin by uh, offering my thanks, uh, especially to Professor Eugene Nagasawa, as the H. G. Wood Professor of Philosophy of Religion and leader of the Global Philosophy of Religion Project. I'm very excited about the work that the project is doing. Fantastic to have this opportunity also today to get to meet a number of others involved in the project. And um, I think the project is doing fantastic work in terms of ex expanding and deepening the range of interests that are represented in the field of philosophy of religion. So I'm very pleased to be able to make this small contribution to the venture by participating in this lecture series. So thank you. Uh, can I also thank uh, Kali and Sumar for your, your help overseeing arrangements as well? Thank you. Um, okay, so I think my theme is, as the uh, slide ind indicates, Eucharistic practice in the Christian life. Uh, I thought I'd talk about Eucharistic practice because, as Martin says, it's a defining feature of Christian commitment. Uh, you might see it as a defining act of Christian identity. As you know, the Eucharist uh, the, is the rite whereby Christians recall the Last Supper on which occasion Jesus took some bread and some wine, saying in turn of each, this is my body and this is my blood, and also instructed his disciples to do this in remembrance of him. So when they assemble um, to recall the Last Supper in this mode, in this Eucharistic mode, Christians are, of course, then responding very directly to this instruction of Jesus to recall him, and in some special way to recall the significance of his life and work. Right, um, I have a written text here, but I probably won't follow it for the most part. So I was proposing to approach this theme um, for the clock. Oh, oh, there's one there, great. <laughs> um, I was proposing to approach this theme by, first of all, thinking about two ways in which we might understand the moral and spiritual significance of stories. And then, unsurprisingly, I'm going to take those two accounts of, of stories and use them as a basis for thinking about the significance we might associate with the, with the Eucharist in particular, thinking of this rite as located within a, a story context and, and bearing some of the significance that it bears by virtue of occupying that particular story context. Uh, am I talking too quickly or am I, can I be heard? Can I <laughs> keep going? Okay. Um, so um, let me say before you then briefly, these two, um, oh, talking rate's good, great. <laughs> these two examples of how we might think about the, the significance of stories. So um, here's a first example. I'm not gonna, throughout the lecture, I'm gonna be um, taking a somewhat panoramic view <laughs> of the terrain. I hope that's all right. I hope that fits with the spirit of the series in terms of just talking in big picture terms about the perspective of different, different faith traditions. So uh, the first of the cases I want to think about when trying to expound the kind of significance that stories might bear, the first of these cases concerns, let's say, to begin with a religious example, a, a particular uh, pra pra practice, a uh, place-based religious practice, let's say pilgrimage. So if you think of pilgrimage, let's take the example of pilgrimage to Lourdes, since we're speaking about a Christian setting in particular today. Uh, it looks as though pilgrims who go to Lord, they're, I take it, moved sometimes by the, the thought that uh, miracles of healing are still associated with the place, but I take it they're also moved by the thought in an, an event of divine disclosure once happened here. In other words, I take, I take it the religious significance of the site is a function partly of its history, not just of what happens there currently. In some fashion or other, it seems like pilgrims to this site, and I take it you could make a similar kind of case with respect to pilgrimage practices and other traditions. It looks like the significance of the site is in some in the present is in some way connected to what once happened there. And people think it worthwhile to visit the site in the present because by virtue of being located at the site in the present, they can accord some special kind of acknowledgement to the events that are associated with the site. Of course, they can acknowledge those events in other ways, just in purely intellectual ways by recalling the events. But it looks like in the background of this sort of practice is the idea that in some fashion, by virtue of being physically present at the site where the event took place, and by virtue of your bodily comportment, I think that's part of the idea <laughs> when located at the place, uh, engaging with the place in bodily terms with due reverence, for example, by virtue of 
engaging with the place in this sort of fashion, you can thereby acknowledge the significance of the site in the present. So in a sort of way, it looks like in this kind of case, we suppose that the histories of places make a kind of practical and attitudinal demand upon us in the present. Their histories are not just history, they also condition the significance that attaches to the place in the present. So there's my, there you go, Damn, that's my <laughs> first example of the, of the kind of significance that stories can bear. Here we're talking about stories which have to do with the history of places, but I take it the example is very easily generalized. I'm not going to try and generalize it, but all the while, of course, when we navigate our way through the world in our dealings with, especially with other people, but also with places and with things, all the while what we're doing in these interactions is, is, in, is trying in some fashion, not just intellectually, but through our mode of bodily comportment in particular circumstances, trying to reckon appropriately with the histories of people and places and things to ensure that our dealings with these people and places and things in some way give due recognition to their histories uh, in, in the present. So that's very quick, but there, there's a brief overview <laughs> of one phenomenon which we're all familiar. I began with a somewhat controversial example, the pilgrimage example. I know what course practice of pilgrimage are contested across religious traditions. Um, but nonetheless, I think a, a phenomenon that's evident in the case of the Lord example is, is one we all recognize in everyday life, insofar as we treat the histories of people and places as, in some fashion, entering into their significance in the present and calling for practical acknowledgement in the present. A second example then of the kind of significance we might associate with stories is one I'm going to explore with reference to a, a text from Keith Ward, and here it is. So in this text, Ward is talking about, my goodness, my, my, what I say is coming up in text, that's a bit concerning. Um, so sorry. Um, so in this, in, this, in this text that I'm about to call up, uh, Ward is talking about um, adopting the global religion's perspective here, uh, an Inuit religious custom, a bundle of stories associated with Inuit religious practice. And in particular, these stories concern the figure of, of called Sedna, and Ward writes of this figure, perhaps there are those among the Inuit who take literally the story of the girl Sedna, who began to eat her giant parents and was cast by them beneath the sea, a fundamentalist of Inuit religion. But just as it's clear, Ward writes, to the practitioners of a bear cult in the northern Japanese islands, that spirits do not really eat the food offered to them. So it's quite clear, Ward says, reading this particular bundle of practices associated with Inuit religious traditions, so it's clear that there's no such person as Sedna beneath the waves who controls the movements of whales and seals. Sedna has a particular form in which she appears in visions, but that form has clear symbolic significance, Ward writes, from her dismembered body, her fingers, yet all sea creatures are formed. Her temper is shown in the Arctic storms. Her one eye gives her penetrating vision of all human behavior. Her home at the bottom of the sea is the realm of disobedient souls. Um, so I take it what Ward is inviting us to think in this context is that we have a bundle of stories associated with this figure, mythological figure of Sedna in the Inuit religious tradition, and I take it what he's inviting us to say is that these stories aren't to be read quite literally, as though there were a particular individual living at the bottom of the sea, controlling the movement of the waves and so on. You might say that's a reductionist reading, but maybe we're back that. Um, instead, what we are to do, I think, on Ward's account is to treat these stories as in some way epitomizing a whole region of experience, the, the, in particular the, the sea from the Inuit vantage point. And this is a conclusion he draws quite explicitly. So here I'm suggesting then again, we find the idea of storied identity having a certain kind of role to play in human life with reference to the Lord's site, the Lord site of pilgrimage. We can see how storied identity might play a certain role in regulating our relations to the material world. I think this is another way in which storied identity might play in regulating our relations to the material world. Here it's, if you like, a whole region of experience, not a particular place now, but a whole region of experience that somehow comes to acquire a kind of storied identity uh, in the sort of way that Ward is describing. And he comments, the form of Sedna then is an eidetic representation <laughs> uh, of the harsh, often arbitrary seeming and yet life supporting conditions of the Arctic world. So I take it what he's saying is here we have a kind of personification of these the fundamental conditions of existence that govern Inuit life, so far as their relationship to the sea is, of course, at the core of their life. What's here represented in an image, Ward writes, is the character of the sea itself, so he claims, as a power for good and harm. What the shaman meets in the dream quest is this internalized image of the powers which bound Inuit life. The image is a mind-produced representation. So the character of the ultimate powers for good and ill which surround the Inuit. This mystery, the limits of human existence, is represented 
in these Inuit customs, not by analytical laws or explanations, but by stories, which seek to express what sort of reality it is that sustains and yet always threatens human existence. So, um, I think Ward here is trying to uh, uh, think about again, another context in which uh, stories, again, can play a role in summing up for us the significance, not now of particular things, particular places or people or objects, but whole regions of experience. And I take it the thought is that the Sedna figure for the Inuit in some way or other helps to regulate their relations to the sea. Why? Because the Sedna story in some way or other, I think this is the thought, um, as he says, stands as an eidetic representation of, or in some, in some way sums up the basic tendencies of the sea. Uh, I mean, I think perhaps the most obvious way of drawing out this idea is by reference to the idea that uh, her temper, insofar as <laughs> she has a temper that's unpredictable and fierce, these features of Sedna, as represented in these stories, map onto, I think, what is inviting us to think, um, the Inuit's perception of the, of, the, of the sea and their relations to the sea, that the sea's behavior similarly is precious, unpredictable, but also, of course, a source of danger. So I take it the background thought is then that these stories in some way give us a, a dense representation of the way in which the, the sea is registered in Inuit experience. Um, the, the way in which the sea is encountered as a kind of personal presence in Inuit experience. Um, and the idea is to try and in some way capture the basic propensities of the sea <laughs> as they feature in Inuit experience by reference to these stories. But I think it would be, again, as with the example of Lourdes, it would be very easy to multiply examples. I think of say Greco-Roman religion, I take it part of what's going on there in stories of the god of, of love or of war, or for that matter of the sea, is that these various mythological figures in some fashion serve to epitomize a region of experience, not individual places or things, but a whole region of experience and thereby help you regulate our relation to that region of experience. So that's a very rapid, in fact, hurried <laughs> introduction to two perspectives upon stories, but I, I'm going to set, set those two, two accounts aside now and begin to work my way in the direction of an understanding of the Eucharist, which appeals to these two pictures of how it is that stories can carry a kind of moral and spiritual significance. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the, the first kind of example, where we suppose that a history, the history of a, of a place, or it may be of a person or a thing, in some way conditions its significance in the present, in such a way as to call for practical acknowledgement in the present, through our um, comportment in relationship to the thing in the present. Okay. I'm going to start by taking a, an example of, since we're dealing with the Christian tradition, I'll, I'll take an example of a of a, a theologian of uh, evident importance in the Christian tradition, Thomas Aquinas. And I'm going to think a little bit about his account of why it is that we should relate to other human beings um, according to the in, injunction that we are to treat them as our neighbors or to love them as ourselves. So here is this kind of core Christian ethical ideal. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. For Aquinas, of course, that ideal is binding upon Christians for the reason that it's commanded by Jesus. <laughs> but interestingly, when in the Son of Theologia, he comes to consider the question of why we should love our neighbors as ourselves, he actually gives a different, another account, as well as appealing to the words of Jesus, in turn, of course, echoing texts from the Hebrew Bible. He appeals to a further account. And what strikes me about this further account is, is that it, it seems to me anyway, on my reading of the passage, to be appealing to the idea, once again, of storied identity. What he's saying is that neighbor love is a fitting response in our relations to other human beings for the reason that these other human beings are the bearers of a certain storied identity. But in this case, the storied identity is rooted not in their past, not in their history, but in their future. Uh, so here's how he develops the idea. As it happens in this text, he's talking about whether we're required to love the angels as our neighbors, which might seem like a somewhat specialized sort of concern. <laughs> but is it in, the, in, in fact, he applies, the <laughs> he applies the, this is not going to get theology a good re reputation in terms of the, the administrators and concerns about impact. Um, so anyway, I just want to say uh, he applies the same kind of argument when thinking about why it is that we are to treat other human beings as our neighbors. So we can see the, the, the considerations that he cites here as generalizable from his point of view. So he writes, the friendship of charity, this is his expression for neighbor love, 
It's founded upon the everlasting happiness in which human beings share in common with the angels. For it's written that in the resurrection, human beings shall be as the angels of God in heaven. It's therefore evident that the friendship of charity extends also to the angels. So I take it that what Aquinas is doing in this text is inviting us to think about um, not the history of human beings, um, but, and of angels for that matter, but their future. Uh, I take it that what he's doing is inviting us to think that we will one day share with other human beings in the everlasting happiness of the afterlife or in his terms, the beatific vision. And I take it his thought is that by virtue of the fact that we will one day be in that condition, we have that shared future, that shared eschatological future, future relating to uh, the afterlife, we have that shared eschatological future, that truth about us creates an ethical claim uh, which is active in the present, which makes a demand upon us in the present. So I think this is an interesting mode of argument. I don't think you'll find it in many moral philosophy textbooks. Um, of course, in moral philosophy textbooks, you'll find the idea that the, the past in various ways makes a difference to our moral relations to other human beings. Of course it does. If I've harmed someone, then prima facie, other things being equal, there's a, there's a reason to think that I owe them at least an apology in the present. But Aquinas is not here appealing to the past, instead he's appealing to the future as a way of grounding the idea that human beings make a certain kind of ethical claim upon us. And again, in the moral philosophy textbooks, you'll find the idea, of course, that our future is relevant when we <laughs> consider how we ought to act in moral terms. But the, the way in which the future standardly is given a role in, in this sort of account is, of course, by reference to the idea that our actions in the present have consequences. So we're to take account of the future when deciding how to act in the present by reference to the idea that we should choose in the present actions which have optimal consequences or at least sufficiently good consequences in some respects. But I take it that's not what Aquinas is saying here. He's not commending neighbor love as an ideal of life for the reason that neighbor love uh, is apt to produce good consequences. <laughs> I think what he's saying is uh, we're starting from the thought that this, the everlasting happiness, as he puts it in this text, is an established truth, rooted in the will of God, I suppose, but an established truth. And in the present, we are to reckon with that truth that we will share with one another in this condition of everlasting happiness, where that condition will be one of, I take it the thought is deep-seated fellowship or friendship by virtue of sharing in this fundamental good in the future. We will relate to others on the basis of a deep-seated friendship. And that truth about our shared future, he seems to be saying, in some sense already established truth about our shared future, creates a kind of ethical demand upon us in the present and requires of us that we relate to other human beings in a certain way in the present, and in particular in the ways that he associates with love of neighbor. So I think, again, we can see this pattern of argument operating in other contexts. You know, if someone was once your friend, then you might say, even if the friendship has lapsed, it remains the case that your relations to the person in the present are to some extent accessible as more or less appropriate by reference to this truth about your history. I take it Aquinas is making a similar move with respect to the idea that other human beings will in the future, in the eschatological future, be your friends, be reunited to you in this particularly close relationship, an unsurpassably close relationship insofar as it's built around a sharing in an unsurpassably great good, namely the vision of God or sharing in the life of God. So I mentioned, I mentioned the Aquinas text because <laughs> it draws on the idea I introduced with reference to Lord and pilgrimage sites. Um, but, but pushes those ideas in a somewhat novel direction by saying that individuals can bear a storied identity that's morally and spiritually important, not only by reference to their past, as with the Lord site, but also by reference to their future, as with the case of the eschatological future. And so it's natural to ask then if this mode of argument works, if indeed it's the case that by virtue of the fact that human beings, we share with other human beings in this future, understood as a deep-seated relationship or friendship, um, we might ask ourselves, well, what kind of life in the present constitutes proper acknowledgement <laughs> of this truth about our future relations to other human beings, granted that it calls for some kind of acknowledgement in the way that storied identity in other contexts calls for some sort of practical acknowledgement in the present? What kind of practical acknowledgement is due to other human beings by virtue of the fact that they have this particular storied identity, one of sharing with us in this eschatological future, so conceived as a relationship of deep seated friendship. And I take it Aquinas' thought is that what makes neighbor love an appropriate response to this truth about our shared future is that it is itself a form of friendship 
as he says in the text here, it is the friendship of charity. So I take it the background thought is that <laughs> if, if it's the case that one day in the eschatological future, we will share with others in this deep seated relationship of friendship, we want to know how we are to relate to them in the present, therefore, um, I think it, but the background thought here seems to be that we should, so far as we can in the present, foreshadow that future. <laughs> we should, so far as we can, relate to other human beings as friends even now, even if in a somewhat inchoate or imperfect form. So I take it that's the pattern of argument. Um, so I, I'm quite interested in the, in the structure of the argument. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting to appeal to the future in this sort of way without appealing simply to consequences, but to appeal to the future in rather the way that we standardly appeal to the past as a way of grounding a claim about an individual story of identity, as a way of establishing the nature of our ethical relationship to that individual in the present. And I think also of interest is the fact that if I, if I read incorrectly what Aquinas is suggesting that if we are to give due recognition to the story of identity in the present, then what we need is to, so far as we can, adopt a mode of life in the present in our relations to others, which in some way anticipates or foreshadows the, the deepened form of friendship that we will enjoy with them in the eschatological future. Right. I'm going to tell you a story about Peppa Pig now, if that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, so I want now to turn to, at last, <laughs> to the question of the Eucharist. So um, it seems to me that what Aquinas is doing is picking out one element of our eschatological future, as he understands it. The one element of our eschatological future he's picking out is the idea that we will relate to others on the basis of this deep-seated relationship of friendship in the eschatological future. But on his own view of the matter anyway, it looks like we can give a fuller specification of what our eschatological future will be like. For Aquinas, unsurprisingly, that eschatological future involves not simply a deep-seated relationship of friendship with other human beings, but also, in addition, uh, a newly intimate relationship with God and it's this, the second truth which grounds the first. It's because we have this newly intimate relationship with God and we share in that relationship with other human beings in the eschatological future, that our relationship to other human beings in the eschatological future can run as deep as it does. So <laughs> it seems to me we could in principle raise this question. I don't think Aquinas raises it, but we could in principle raise this question. Granted that, we can take that feature of our eschatological future, which concerns the fact that we will one day relate to others on the basis of a deep-seated relationship of friendship. We take that strand of Aquinas' account of our eschatological future and ask what mode of life in the present counts as a fitting acknowledgement of that truth about our eschatological future. Can we make the same move with respect to a kind of fuller account of our eschatological future? That's to say an account which makes reference not just to the fact that our future relations will be one of friendship, but which adds in this further claim that that deep-seated relationship of friendship in our eschatological future will be grounded in a relationship to God. Um, so is there available to us in the present a mode of life that in some way gives due acknowledgement, not just to the, the fact that our relations to others will be one of friendship in the eschatological future, but also to the fact that that relationship of friendship will be grounded in a newly intimate relationship with God. So um, <laughs> I take it that, here last is a reference to the Eucharist, sorry, it's only, I've only got about 10 minutes to go. Um, I take it that on the, on the traditional kind of Christian account of the matter, the Eucharist bears precisely this significance. The Eucharist on the traditional account of the matter is represented as a kind of foreshadowing of what Christians will sometimes call the heavenly banquet. In other words, a foreshadowing of the fact that in the eschatological future, we will be drawn into a new mode of relationship with other human beings, one that's represented logistically in the form of a shared meal, where that deepened form of relationship with other human beings involves also a, a deepened relationship with God, and deepened relationship with the person of Christ, in particular as God incarnate, who participates in the eschatological banquet. So we could think about a bit about this, uh, but perhaps given time is marching on, we could, we could hold it over for questions. But it just strikes me that 
you could, in principle, appeal to the Eucharist and understand its significance in rather the way that Aquinas understands the significance of neighbor love, but reading the Eucharist as having this further significance as being a, a way of acknowledging our eschatological future in the present by way of a kind of shadowing of that future, by way of adopting a mode of life in the present that in some way anticipates that future. In the case of the Eucharist and the standard Christian representation of the rite, it foreshadows the future, it foreshadows the eschatological banquet, not only by foreshadowing the truth that our relations to others in the eschatological future will be one of friendship, but also foreshadowing the truth, the further truth, that that relationship of friendship will be grounded in a deepened relationship to God. So here I'm trying to basically pick up Aquinas' account of neighbor love on these two points. First, think of the eschatological future as exercising a kind of demand upon us in the present, inviting us to think about how we should live in the present in our relations to other human beings, but giving a fuller specification of the nature of our eschatological future than he does when thinking about neighbor love and arguing that the Eucharist, insofar as it's an anticipation of the eschatological banquet, does in fact, on the standard Christian narrative, anticipate our eschatological future in both these respects, not only with respect to our relations to other human beings, but also with respect to the idea that that relationship to other human beings will be anchored in a renewed relationship to God. I think it's quite easy to ground that reading of the Eucharist in various passages that you find in the New Testament, and we can think about those if you want, but it is also the standard Christian reading of of the, the significance of the Last Supper itself, um, which is an anticipation of the when, at heavenly banquet when Jesus will be reunited with his disciples, but also a standard Christian reading of the significance of the Eucharist insofar as the Eucharist itself is an echoing of the, the Last Supper and itself a shared meal, which looks forward to this further shared meal, what's represented as a shared meal in the eschatological future when we will enter into a new mode of relationship with other human beings and one that's enabled by our new mode of relationship to God. Let me think of one way of developing this idea. I mean, clearly in the background here, I haven't filled out the thought, but in the background here is that by virtue of Jesus's words at the Last Supper, Christians disagree on this question, of course, but by virtue of Jesus's words at the Last Supper, when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, Christians have felt, many Christians have felt licensed to see that Christ is somehow present under the form of bread and wine in the Last Supper, so that in our relations, to, in the Christian relation to these material things in the present, they can engage with the person of Christ and thereby, in a particularly deep way, anticipate this eschatological future, which consists in a deep-seated relationship with God, um, with Christ considered as divine. So let me take one way of developing this thought, which you find in Aquinas again, and here Aquinas is talking about the Eucharist and the sense in which Christ is present in the Eucharist. And this is what he writes. Of course, he thinks that thinking of Christ as really present, as he puts it, um, rather than just present as a sign in the Eucharist, is implied in Jesus' words at the Last Supper when he says, this is my body and this is my blood. But he gives this further consideration for thinking it's important that Christ should be in some in a sense really present in the Eucharist. He writes, it's a special feature of friendship to live together with friends. As the philosopher, meaning Aristotle, says that um, he promises us his bodily presence. Yet meanwhile, in our pilgrimage, meaning our life here and now in this, in, in this world, in our pilgrimage, Christ does not deprive us of his bodily presence, but unites us with himself in this sacrament through the truth of his body and blood. So it's what strikes me as significant about this text is that here Aquinas treats Eucharistic practice as a way of realizing a certain kind of relationship to Christ in the present, namely a relationship of friendship, drawing on this background thought that for individuals to count as friends, they need to live together to be sort of thought with particular resonance in time of COVID, all of you out there who aren't here in person today. Um, that we, it's to, to sustain friendship, then we need to be, we need to live together in a way that has a bodily dimension standardly. We need to be present to one another in bodily terms. So one of the things that strikes me if we're thinking about Eucharistic practice and the Christian form of life as we are this evening, one of the things that strikes me is that Aquinas is inviting us to think of the theme of friendship as at the core 
of the Christian account of the Christian life. So the theme of friendship is relevant to the core Christian ethical ideal of love of neighbor if we follow occurrences of the matter, count of the matter, because friendship counts as an appropriate mode of life by virtue of acknowledging the truth that we will one day exist in a deep seated relationship of friendship to others in the eschatological future. And friendship counts as an acknowledgement of that truth by virtue of being itself a form of friendship. Moreover, he says in this text that we're looking at now, it's also the case that by virtue of their relation to the Eucharistic elements, the bread and the wine, the Christian can take up a relationship of friendship with Christ in the present. And moreover, insofar as that friendship with Christ, that Eucharistically mediated friendship with Christ, is extended to others through participation in the rite, then you have a form of relationship to Christ and therefore to God that is shared between human beings and that contributes thereby to the deepening of bonds between human beings, and which thereby stands as an anticipation of this eschatological future which will be a condition where a deepened relationship with other human beings is grounded in a deepened relationship to God. So the theme of friendship appears in all these different places <laughs> with respect to our relations to other human beings, with respect to our relationship to, to Christ in the Eucharist, um, and with respect to um, both our future, future relations to other human beings and our relations to them in the present. So in brief, and very hurriedly again, I tried thereby to sketch one understanding of how it is that the first of the two accounts of the idea of storied identity that I introduced can be applied to the Eucharist. And so you can take the Eucharist on this broadly Thomistic reading of its significance uh, as, have, as bearing this particular significance. It constitutes a way in which we can here and now in the present, on the Christian view, here and now in the present give due acknowledgement to our eschatological future. Just as in neighbor love, we can give due acknowledgement to that future so far as it takes the form of friendship with other human beings. So in the practice of the Eucharist, we can give due acknowledgement to that future and so far as it takes the form not only of a, a deepened relationship with other human beings, but with a relationship with other human beings that's deepened by virtue of a deepened relationship to God. Um, so I think, What's exciting about this view, though I may not have represented until my tone of voice, I should say, what's exciting about this view, I think from the Christian vantage point is that it, it, it takes this idea of human life as significantly built around the attempt to acknowledge storied identity, the storied identities of other people in our daily dealings with them, the storied identities of places and things, a significant chunk of human life, the well-lived life consists in giving due recognition to storied identity of other people and places and things, and on the Christian account of the Eucharist, on this reading of it, at least that I'm offering, it looks like the significance of the rite consists partly in the fact that it enables us in this very fundamental way to reckon with the storied identity of human beings, insofar as that storied identity is, is stored up in a special way in these truths about the eschatological future of human beings, which constitute in a way the most fundamental story truths about human beings. Those most fundamental story about, truths about your other human beings, I think on this kind of perspective, in this Christian perspective, are capable of being acknowledged in the presence in a special sort of way, in a way that's not otherwise possible, at least if we follow Aquinas' reading of the sense in which Christ is present in the Eucharist. These truths are capable of being acknowledged in a special sort of way through Eucharistic practice. And from a Christian vantage point, that's part, I take it, of the significance of the practice. So I think I'm due to finish about six, is that right? Excellent. So now I'm going to speed up. Um, I'm going to talk about the, <laughs> the second strand of the uh, the account I developed earlier, the way in which stories can carry, can carry moral and spiritual significance. Um, and this, this strand is perhaps, I said, the application of this strand to the case of the Eucharist is perhaps still more speculative. But anyway, here we go. So, just wanted to check that was the last slide. <laughs> so, um, if we think back to the Sedna stories uh, and the way in which, in this context, stories come to shape our relations to the everyday material world. I take it the figure of Sedna bears a kind of religious significance for the Inuit. We might ask, how is it that the figure of Sedna comes to bear this religious significance for the Inuit? And again, we could discuss this matter in the, in the, in the questions, but it seems to me the figure of Sedna is significant in religious terms for the Inuit in at least these two respects. First of all, as expounded by Ward anyway, the figure of Sedna
discloses the basic patterns that govern the behavior of the sea as it's manifest in the newest experience. So the figure of Sedna is recorded in these, there's the stories about Sedna, the Sedna stories have this kind of revelatory role. They, they reveal something about the nature of the sea as it's encountered in the newest experience. Because the sea, of course, has a special significance of the Inuit, it's a source of their livelihood, it's a domain of experience which bears a special existential charge for that reason. It, it follows that it's, it's religiously significant that, you should, that the, the Sedna story should disclose the fundamental patterns that inform the behavior of the sea. But I take it that the Sedna stories, as, as Ward reads them anyway, although he, he says they're not to be read literally, nonetheless, I take it their role in Inuit religious thought is not just to characterize behavioral tendencies of the sea, but also in some way to draw the person into a kind of lived relationship with whatever, whatever fundamental principles <laughs> underlie the behavior of the sea. So I take it that background thought is that the figure of Sedna as encountered in story mediated relationship to the sea, or as encountered in the, the visions of the shaman experiences of the figure of Sedna, I take it the thought is that in these respects, the Inuit are able to relate themselves to the sea itself, um, the fundamental principles which underpin the patterns of behavior that are disclosed in the stories about Sedna. So I take it then the figure of Sedna bears these two kinds of significance, related kinds of significance. First, the figure epitomizes, gives us a kind of personification of the sea and its behavior and the way in which it impinges upon the experience of the Inuit. And secondly, I think the thought is that through your relationship to the figure so represented, you can thereby enter into a kind of lived relationship to the sea itself. So the role of the figure has not just a kind of descriptive role, summing up the nature of the sea as manifested in Inuit experience, but also this further role of drawing the person potentially into some kind of lived encounter with the sea itself, the basic principles which inform the patterns of behavior that are picked out in the segment stories. So I take it to make a very large step indeed. Um, <laughs> I take it that, that from the Christian vantage point, just as for the Inuit, the nature of the sea can be recorded in storied form, the basic patterns of form, the behavior of the sea can be recorded in storied form. I take it from the Christian vantage point, because the other religious traditions will have their counterparts of this idea, but from the Christian vantage point, it's true that the nature, not just of the sea now, but of the material order itself can be captured in, in storied form, in stories of the creation and in stories of the eschatological future. And of course, on the Christian perspective, the basic pattern informing the world, the world and its behavior and the way in which impinges upon human experience is from the Christian vantage point recorded in the stories of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. So these stories then function in this respect, like the Sedna stories, I take it. <laughs> they give us, they kind of epitomize, they sum up a fundamental structure of reality. Only now the reality we're dealing with is not just the sea, but reality as such. And I take it again on the Christian point of view, there's this further point of correspondence with the Sedna stories. So the Jesus stories not only disclose the fundamental structure of reality, from the Christian point of view, that they disclose that structure to be one of restorative, regenerative love. But in addition, the, the Jesus stories um, also disclose, <laughs> disclose um, Jesus as the agent um, of the basic pattern which um, is observed um, and recorded in the stories. Um, so the background thought clearly in the Christian context is that by virtue of his life, death and resurrection, um, Christ, if, if Christ effects this understanding of what the basic structure of reality is about. That understanding of what the basic structure of reality is about, recorded in the stories, is brought to reality, is, is actualized in the life of this individual. So I take it it is for this reason that Christians have traditionally spoken of Christ as the Logos, whereby the Logos, I take it, is meant the idea that the Logos is God's purpose in creation, plan for creation, if you like. And thus the thought in, in speaking of Jesus as the Logos, I take it what Christians have meant is that in this individual, you can see that plan displayed. It's disclosed in the actions of this individual. But not only is it this plan or purpose or Logos disclosed, it's also effected in the life of this individual by virtue of the transformative power of his life and death and resurrection. 
So what I'm driving at here, perhaps in a rather roundabout way, <laughs> is the thought that here's a further kind of storied significance, one that attaches not to particular individuals or places in the first instance, but to whole regions of experience. We can see that kind of storied significance operating with respect to the Sedna stories. I think something a little bit similar is going on uh, in the stories of, of Jesus. Obviously, it matters for Christians that Jesus should be a historical figure, <laughs> whereas Ward is clear that Sedna is not to be treated as a, as a historical figure. But bracketing that consideration, I take it that the Jesus stories function rather like the Sedna stories in this respect. They disclose the fundamental pattern of the world, and they also disclose, not only disclose that fundamental pattern, but these stories record the activity of the individual who effects that pattern. So I have four minutes in which to make this connection to the Eucharist. <laughs> So I take it that, so if we accept that reading of, of what's at stake for Christians, at least part of what's at stake, not the entirety of what's at stake, but part of what's at stake for Christians in this very familiar language of Christ as the Logos, Christ as the one who discloses and reflect, affects God's purposes. Drawing here on the background analogy of the Sedna stories. Then we move to think about the Eucharist and we ask about what's going on when we think about the significance that attaches to the the actions of the participant in the Eucharist from the Christian point of view. So I take it though from the Christian point of view, a person who participates in the Eucharist, and so far as they're active in the Eucharist, um, thereby their actions refer back to the Last Supper, of course, since it's in the Last Supper that Jesus institutes the Eucharist, and in turn thereby they refer to Christ's passion, which is foreshadowed by the Last Supper. And in turn, for the reasons we've been exploring, the actions of the person in the Eucharist are uh, involved in looking forward to the eschatological banquet. So what I'm trying to suggest is that the actions of the individual, <laughs> individual Christian in the Eucharist, and so far as they sit within this story context, one that looks back um, to the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and looks forward also to the eschatological banquet, the actions of the individual Christian in the Eucharistic setting so far as they're located within that story context, in a way, in, in a localized way, disclose the basic pattern that informs the sum of reality from the Christian point of view. So the individual actions of the, <laughs> of the Christian in this setting disclose the basic pattern of things, and so far as those actions are located within this particular story context, one that refers to the Last Supper and the eschaton and so on, and the passion. And in addition, I take it, and in, in, this is a more controversial claim, <laughs> I take it in a sort of fashion from the Christian reading of the matter, what the individual Christian does through participation in the Eucharist is align themselves with the eschatological future. They don't just acknowledge it appropriately in the present so far as they can by foreshadowing it. They also in, their, in some small measure give their assent to it, they align themselves with it, and in some small measure thereby they contribute to its realization. They don't just acknowledge the story, but they kind of step into the story and play their part, their divinely enabled part in the unfolding of the story by virtue of participating in the Eucharist. If that's the right way to think about what's going on, and again, it's rather speculative, but that's the right way to think about what's going on, or what the particular significance that attaches to the actions of Christians in the Eucharist, then we can say that their actions in these respects at least are an echo of the that the significance they bear echoes the significance that's borne by the Jesus story. The Jesus story um, sustains the claim that Christ is the Logos, insofar as Jesus, his life discloses the basic pattern of creation and actualizes that basic pattern. What I'm suggesting is that in a sort of way in the Eucharist, the individual Christian's actions and the Christian understanding of the matter also disclose the basic pattern of reality if those actions sit within this particular story context, and also in, in their own localized fashion, contribute to the actualization of the story pattern of reality, and by virtue of the fact that hereby, in a way that's not possible, the same profundity in any other context, the individual Christian assents to the eschatological future, actively participates in the eschatological future, and thereby, in this, to that extent, contributes to its actualization. So if that's the right way of speaking, perhaps it isn't, but <laughs> that's the right way of speaking about the actions of the Christian in the Eucharist, then we could say that these actions, by virtue of these actions, we can say we have some basis, the same sort of basis that we have from a Christian vantage point when we speak of Christ as the Logos, we have the same sort of basis for speaking of the Logos as present in the actions of the individual Christian in the Eucharistic setting, insofar as those actions both disclose and in some small measure affect the basic pattern that informs reality.
And that sounds like a rather daring claim that Logos is present, not, not just in Christ, <laughs> but, in, but in the, the actions of the individual Christian in the Eucharistic setting. But I take it it is the claim that's implied in the familiar Christian teaching that uh, it's the, the church, above all, the church is constituted in the Eucharistic setting that's the body of Christ, not just the bread and wine, but also the Eucharistic community is the body of Christ. And one way of spelling out that thought I'm suggesting is by thinking about the way in which we can take the logos to be present in those actions for structurally the same kinds of reasons that Christians have taken the logos to be present in the life of Jesus. Right, I think I should probably draw to a close. <laughs> so in brief, what I've tried to do is, I think, I think, my, I think my, my charge as, as Martin gave it to me was to say something about the Christian tradition from a, quite a broadly philosophical point of view in the space of 45 minutes. Um, and so I've tried to do that by taking not, not, not abstractly doctrinal claims, they're, they're all woven through the Eucharist, of course, you can't really understand what's going on in a Christian life and the Eucharist independently of the story about the significance of Christ and the spirit and the church and atonement, all those, all those doctrines are woven through it. What I've tried to do is to begin with, a, with an act, if you like, rather than the abstract, beginning with the abstract, abstractly doctrinal considerations. An act that bear, must bear from the Christian point of view a special significance in defining Christian identity. It's the one act above all, I say this, given the Jesus' commission of the Last Supper. It's the one act above all that identifies someone as a Christian participating in this rite. And I've tried to reflect a little bit of on two kinds of significance it may bear. First of all, I've suggested, drawing on the first of my models of more on spiritual significance of stories, first of all, I've suggested from the Christian vantage point, participation in the Eucharist gives us a way of reckoning with, acknowledging truthfully our eschatological future in a, in a particularly profound way, a way in which we're not otherwise able to give due acknowledgement to our eschatological future. And, and secondly, I've tried to suggest that from the Christian vantage point, there's a sense in which God as Logos is present in the Eucharist in a special sort of way, because in this context in particular, by virtue of its storied identity, here appealing to the second kind of, of the models I introduced about moral and spiritual significance of stories, by virtue of the storied identity that attaches to the actions of the individual Christian in the Eucharistic setting, we have some basis for saying that the logos, the basic pattern of reality, is both disclosed here and, and, and profoundly at work here in ways that involve the enactment or realization of that pattern. So I hope, yes, I'm going to stop. I hope, <laughs> I hope in this sort this way I the, uh, clearly similar kinds of claim it would be interesting to think about in the context of the global philosophy of religion project uh, exactly how how much of this this kind of perspective transfers to other religious contexts i take it it does very largely transfer in in various ways and I, that's partly for me the significance of the sedna story i think some of the phenomena i've been describing are deep-seated phenomena uh, the role of story in the two respects i've distinguished which operate across contexts not just in religious contexts but other contexts what I've tried to display in, in this little talk is just how, in the Christian setting, this particular storied understanding of the structure of reality, including its eschatological future and what enables its eschatological future in the life of Christ, how that picture of the storied structure of reality can be rendered present and accessed and engaged with in a particularly profound way from the Christian point of view under the conditions of the Eucharistic rite. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for the fantastic and very rich talk. Um, so we're going to move into question time in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to give Mark uh, a second to get a, a quick drink and to pause before we start grilling him. Um, and, and, and I'll take the opportunity too to explain how the question uh, and answer session will work here. Um, so uh, those of you who are watching online, which is the vast majority, if you could type your questions into the chat function in the Zoom um, room, then I will read out those questions. Apologies in advance if I have to summarize or, or briefly um, um, uh, uh, shorten a couple of them. Uh, and so we'll go through questions which I'll deliver to Mark um, that are written in the chat. And those of you who are present in the room can raise a hand and ask a question, which I'll then again summarize just to make sure it's caught uh, for the recording because it, the audio might not catch the, um, the sound of people speaking in the room. Um, just before we do that, Kelly, do you think it's possible to change so that we can actually view Mark as he's answering the questions rather than the screen? If, if that's not possible, that's fine. I didn't think it would be so. Um, not a close up of Mark. It's not possible, that's fine. But... Yeah. 
that's okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we can now we can see Mark um, as he as he responds to the questions and his looks of terror or delight. Um, okay. So um, as I say, feel free to type your questions into the chat box as we will get started. If you're ready. Mark. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, should I down some? Thank you. Sorry to take. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, okay. So the first question um, comes from uh, Mick Burley, which I'll read out to you now. Um, he says, friendship implies a relationship between equals, does it not? But Jesus Christ for the Christian is not uh, one's equal, but the way, the truth, and the life. Do we then need to disambiguate Aquinas' talk um, of friendship, differentiating friendship among creatures from friendship with Christ? And I think this is attaches to the sort of two thirds of the way through when you were talking about Aquinas' views mm -hmm. on friendship with each other and friendship with Christ in the future. Um, so shall I, yeah, shall I reply now? Where that's shall I stand? Okay. Oh, I can stand here. That's, is that the view that people have? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. there we go. So uh, thank you very much, Mick. Um, nice. I can't quite see you. You must be out there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry not to be able to see you in person. Mick is a colleague from the um, University of Leeds, so I know, who writes widely on the theme of stories and religion. So I was particularly worried that Mick was going to ask the first question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you very much for that very um, insightful, incisive question. Gosh, yes, so it, the question of whether as far as friendship involves relationship between equals, going back to this Aristotelian tradition, which Aquinas, of course, is drawing upon, we might raise the question of whether um, we can assimilate in the way that Aquinas seems to be friendship with God and friendship with, friendship with God and our friendship with human beings. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. I take it uh, on the Christian vantage point, um, it matters for, in this context that Christ, he's talking about the friendship with Christ, of course, in particular, isn't Aquinas in that text, in my views. Um, and I take it in matters from the Christian point that, of course, Christ is both human and divine on um, the standard kind of account of the matter, according to Christian orthodoxy. But I take it in part that's what's going on. In part, the thought is that you can be related to Christ on the basis of equality, insofar as Christ has a human nature. I think there is a larger story as well. I think I need to talk to David here <laughs> um, about the, Christ the Christian account of um, Kenosis, uh, the idea that in some way in the incarnation, in taking on human form, God empties God's self. Um, so there are various, of course, disputed ways in Christian tradition of reading the idea of kenosis. But I take it that's also relevant here. Not only is it the case that Christ is straightforwardly human insofar as Christ has a human nature and is therefore the proper subject of relationship or friendship, one involving relationship and equality, but it's also true that God, under the conditions of the incarnation, has entered into a, on the Christian account of the matter, um, a kind of a canonic state. Again, there are, Christians will read this claim differently when you find in various scriptural sources. Also, the Philippians, but uh, I take it on the Christian point of view, in some sort of fashion, God has condescended <laughs> to relate to us on the basis of, the, as, of equality. We can't claim that relationship for ourselves, of course. But part of the Christian story, I think, is one of the that God has taken up such a relationship. And if God chooses to take up such a relationship. And to that extent, it becomes licit, even if in and of itself from the human side, it wouldn't be. So something of that sort, but I think your questions help because it does point us to very basic questions about the notion of incarnation from the Christian vantage point and what's involved in the trans from the Christian vantage point in the, the transformation of our relationship to God that's affected by the incarnation. And the central strand of the transformation, I take it from the Christian point of view, is that in some sense, God now relates to human beings on a different basis. <laughs> and part of that difference is a mode of relationship has to do with the sort that God has drawn close to human beings in a particular way, one that enables us to speak about what we mean to blasphemy or something like a relationship or friendship to the impossible between God and human beings. So I head in those two directions, the Chalcedonian account of <laughs> Christ as both human and divine, and secondly, I like, you know, kind of appeal to phonetic theology uh, with significance in this context. But thank you. I need more I ought to say on that, but um, when we meet next, hope not in the near future, we'll be a chance to think further. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And um, David, is this on the same topic? Not really. It's not, I'm not following up the question. I'm just just like, what okay, so questions to ask. So. If you don't mind, I might um, Absolutely right. take another one from the chat first and then come back. Um, okay, so the next question, Mark, um, coming thick and fast, and, and people do keep, keep sticking them in the chat, uh, is from Rhiannon Grant. She says, thank you, Mark. Uh, from the point of view of Quaker theology, or maybe in light of your points, I should say the Religious Society of Friends, 
I have a number of questions about the need for physical elements in this context. Uh, but in the circumstances, I'd like to ask you uh, to re reflect further on communion via Zoom. If the stories carry the moral and spiritual meaning and shape our relations with the world, as in uh, the example of Sedna, could a fresh telling of the Christian story, maybe with an emphasis on the action of the Holy Spirit, enable new understandings of what it means to live together in friendship in a way that helps Christians cope with the challenges of the pandemic in particular? Now, if you want me to repeat any of that. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you, Rhiannon. Another friend from uh, Leeds, uh, though I think actually, I'm made, am I right, Rhiannon? You're now based in, in Birmingham. Anyway, um, nice to hear from you too. And I can't quite see you out there, but I know you're there somewhere. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for that very um, helpful reflection. I am mindful that you know, I was talking in the, in the presentation about Christian perspectives and manifestly those perspectives are in fact multi-stranded depending upon which particular stream of Christian thought you tend to take. And so I'm very, I'm very grateful to you for drawing your attention to the perspective of Quaker theology on some of these questions. Um, although you to some extent set aside that perspective, it would be a great one to think about further. But I think you're interested in that, yes, the, the question of how to foster new forms of relationship, including relations of friendship. As you say, the Pope is our society of friends, so they should, it's a tradition which has a lot to teach us about friendship, as understood in a religious setting. How relationships of friendship might be sustained under the conditions of the pandemic, given that we're meeting one another often enough, not, not directly in bodily terms, as this evening. Um, and so I think that's a very, a very suggestive thought that the account I've been exploring, of course, is an account according to which an understanding of human beings' storied identity, specifically their eschatological identity, you pick up the theme we found in Aquinas, uh, enables a, a certain kind of friendship. I think that, I take it that's his thought, there's a kind of friendship that we are licensed to enter into in our relation to other human beings in the present. By virtue of the fact that we ascribe to other human beings a storied identity, and it's rooted in the idea that we will one day be friends with them in the eschatological future. So I think that's a very, very helpful question. I, um, Aquinas himself, in the ways I suggested, is quite keen to foreground the idea that friendship and Aristotle's treatment of these matters requires living together. So maybe the background question, we, one of the questions we could address here is the extent to which we can properly live together um, in a relevant sense, even if it should be the case that we can't spend time together always under these current conditions in bodily form with one another. So your question is whether, whether in the Christian setting, perhaps other religious settings, we might try to evolve the stories that we use in order to enable new forms of friendship that suits this particular kind of mode of interpersonal encounter. So I don't have a, I don't have a specific suggestion to make. I'm wondering about this. <laughs> whether you might think of specific ways in which the Christian religious narrative or religious narratives associated with other religious traditions might be elaborated in such a way as to enable new forms of friendship under these particular conditions where we can't meet with one another in bodily terms. But I think it's a very suggestive thought. I think it's a, yeah, it's a nice way of picking up the kind of challenge that Aquinas puts and saying that friendship and the nature of the case involves living together in bodily terms. But that's a story, in you know, his own account of the matter, it's a story, it's the story that enable that mode of living together in bodily terms for him from a Christian point of view. This friendship that can take the form of neighbor love is enabled by these stories. So you might, you might indeed, as you're suggesting, Rihanna, I think, try and pick apart those two strands of his account and say, yes, let's agree that the story, that stories, Christian stories among the stories and other religious traditions can enable new forms of friendship. But rather than simply keeping hold of the idea that Aquinas has taken from Aristotle that those forms of friendship should be realized in bodily terms. Let's try and think about how the stories might potentially enable new forms of relationship, not, not forms of relationship which take the form of bodily proximity to others. So I think that's very, yeah, very instructive source to use a basic proposal, a friendship grounded in a certain story setting, the idea that the other person bears a certain story of identity, rooting your relationship to them, your friendship to them, and that sense of their story of identity. We're trying to elaborate the story of identity in ways that speak to our particular circumstances. I think would be a very fruitful venture. So thank you for the thought. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we've got a question from Nathan, and then it's David, and then we have a few more coming in as well. So we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. Uh, so the question from Nathan Ormond is the following. Is there some theoretical virtue to really grounding a uh, story in an eschatological reality, as opposed to just granting the psychological reality or phenomenology of story here? So how is a theory that grounds these stories in 
real future events better, or one one should adopt, rather than a theory that grants these for appearances, but only appeals to psychological entities. Great, thank you very much, Nathan. That's a very searching question again. I feel I ought to retire for 20 minutes and then come back <laughs> <laughs> once again. Um, I, yes, in circumstances, I can't do that. Uh, so let me just follow on with a response that will require further reflection and elaboration. Um, so I, I agree that the, the phenomenological perspective can do a certain amount of work here. That's to say, if, say, the Christian case, let's suppose there is no theatric vision, there is no eschatological future, <laughs> Uh, an individual who signed up to that vision, um, nonetheless, I suppose the vision in this case is, is false, um, they can nonetheless presumably en engage with others, encounter others in a particular mode that would be, wouldn't be possible were they not to, to see their relations with others through the lens of these particular stories. So I think that's true. I think there is to some extent you can begin to think about how stories could play this role um, when entertained by an individual who takes them to be true when in fact they're false. Nonetheless, in terms of the person's lived experience of the world, the stories will still play a governing role in shaping their relationships to other human beings. And I can imagine someone saying, well, look, why don't we think of a further individual, not the individual who takes it to be true, um, when in fact they're false, and then lives on that basis. And some of the troubling about the person who lives on that basis, who actually their relations to others, don't actually, <laughs> aren't actually informed um, by the facts. In fact, their, their relations to others are informed by various misconstruals of the facts. Why don't we say, uh, what about the possibility of treating religious stories simply as fictions, just kind of entertaining the stories without affirming them, without asserting them, and taking them to inform your sense of your relationship to the on this basis? So I do think the stories can play that, religious stories can play that sort of role as well. I think there are some interesting examples, and in, for instance, the recent philosophical literature of people assigning religious stories that kind of significance. Uh, I think, think, for instance, of the work of someone like Raymond Gator, who's quite... <laughs> Who thinks the idea of God's universal parental love, drawing on Christian, a Christian kind of way of working on top of it, is morally quite instructive. <laughs> but for Gaeta, it's sufficient to think of other human beings as intelligibly the old objects of God's love. You don't have to affirm that there is a God who in fact loves them. It's enough to say that these, these individual human beings could, in principle, were there to be a God, be the object of love. And, and viewing them from that vantage point, that's a purely imaginary vantage point, can itself be morally enabling or morally instructive from Gator's point of view. So I think, yes, I think to that extent, uh, in this context too, as well as in the context of the person who affirms the, the truth of the stories, the, in metaphysical terms, you can also think of someone who doesn't affirm their truth in metaphysical terms, but take them to be morally instructive fictions, and such a person would also be able, in some measure, I take it, to enter into this kind of Christian-inspired reading of the significance of our relations with others and to relate to others on that basis. At the same time, I think some work is being done by the, <laughs> done by the idea that the uh, eschatological future uh, is indeed, um, from Aquinas' point of view, let's say the, it matters the eschatological future should be as he represents it to be, because the significance of labor and love, let's say, on the of the matter, is it's not simply labor and love, it counts as an appropriate mode of relationship to others, not, not simply because it kind of represents an attempt to enact a picture of our relations to others, which is merely an ideal. And you could say, well, maybe the idea of the eschatological banquet and so on, it just gives us an ideal of how things really ought to be. If only human relations were perfect, it, you might say, well, given that ideal, it would be great, wouldn't it, if we could, so far as we can, under our present circumstances of life, to approximate to that ideal. That, that, that mode of thinking makes some sense, I think. But I take it for Aquinas, what's missing in that account, where you treat the idea of the eschatological future simply as a kind of ideal, you strip away any commitment to its most physical reality. What's missing from that kind of account, I take it for Aquinas, is that in that case, your, your conduct in the present and your relations to other human beings won't count as a fitting response to what is in fact their eschatological identity. Um, so I take it that on his account of the matter, um, just as with the other examples I gave, the example of Lord, let's say, or other examples in everyday life where we relate to others on the basis of what we take their story of identity in fact to be and judge a certain mode of relationship to them in the present to be appropriate, to be fitting, to be good, to be worthwhile, because it gives due recognition to that truth about their story of identity. So far as that's the story you want to run, and clearly is the kind of story that Aquinas wants to run with respect to the eschatological future, then it rather matters that the eschatological future should, should obtain as a matter of metaphysical truth, because there's a dimension of the significance of the practice of noble love for Aquinas 
which holds by virtue of the fact that the practice constitutes an appropriate response to those truths about the eschatological future. So, so I think yeah, it's a very interesting question. Thank you, Nelson. I think it would be nice to think about more than I have about different ways of reading the significance of religious stories, these stories and other religious stories, um, and the kind of ontological weight you associate with those stories, license, different modes of relationship to other human beings, and different accounts of why those modes of relationship count as good or worthwhile. Thanks. I should pass on to Mark that the comments, there are thank yous coming to those who've from those who've asked questions. So they are thank oh, you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on now to David. Thank you. It relates, you, I hope this comes out, but it, it's I can hear it. Um, it relates very much to what was previously asked, is that I'm wondering about what is the certainty of the eschatology of the future, and what you said about the metaphysics of it uh, in your answer to the previous question, rather suggests to me that is Aquinas assuming that the future in some way is already taking place or already happened? And the surprise that you expressed that making a moral case for why we should love our neighbours isn't based on the past. But based on a future promise, I have vision that we want to share friendship in the future. There's a puzzle that emerges, comes out of that, a rather perverse one, maybe, is that Aquinas, as far as I know, soteriologically, is not a universalist, which means he thinks that whereas you know, Christians will share in the holy bliss and the beatific vision, presumably there are other people who won't. Is their future just as certain as those who are sharing in the love? In which case, does it a rather perverse thing emerge that we should share with some people as if they're eternally condemned? Thank you. That's very helpful, David. Yeah, so I agree with you. Um, the text, mm -hmm. neighbor love is, of course, from a Christian Baptist point, um, intended as a universal force. <laughs> so the idea is you don't love certain individuals as your neighbor and not others. Um, neighbor love is meant to be a kind of unconditional form of love. It's extended to all human beings. And so you might say, well, if that's a fundamental feature of the ideal of neighbor love as it stands within the Christian tradition, how does it fit with, as you're suggesting, a kind of non-universalist non story about salvation? If you're taking a story about salvation to ground this attitude to love of human beings, and if you take this attitude to other human beings to be universally appropriate, the attitude of neighbor love, and you want to ground the attitude of neighbor love in, a, in this truth about sharing and the basic vision together, what, what to do about the fact that some individuals on this kind of picture, on this kind of picture, won't be sharing the beer to the vision. So there was a film that came out <laughs> with um, um, Tom Cruise of it, possibly, uh, and he worked for the Department of Pre Crime. This is the idea of arresting people before they commit crime. <laughs> and it created a whole moral debate about can you really blame something for somebody if they haven't yet done? Yes. Yeah. So, so, the minority report, that was it. Oh, and so okay. it relates a bit to that question yeah. about the moral background of what the yeah. is trying to impress upon us. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So I've wondered about this too. I think um, for what it's worth, I don't, if you're non-universalist, I don't think that needs to be on I mean, taking this kind of tenistic story about why it is you should, <laughs> you should treat others as your neighbors. If you're a non-universalist, I don't think it too much disrupts the practical implications of this kind of account. Why? For the reason that under the conditions of this life, again, a kind of theme that's kind of looms quite large in Christian literature, under the conditions of this life. You can't be sure <laughs> with respect to another individual which category they fall in, whether they fall in the category of those who will share in the bit of vision or not. And they, you know, in some, some ways of developing the story, of course, it's, it's a future in some respect is open in this respect. Um, and so I think you could imagine someone then trying to apply the tenistic kind of account of the matter that what gives other human beings a special kind of significance in the present is this truth about the rest of the world in the future. And then in this non universalist mode, saying, oh, by the way, um, we're not here by committed to the fear that everyone will be able to take the future. All we're committed to saying is that in our relations to other human beings in the present, we should treat them as though they were <laughs> going to share in that future. Why? Because in treating them as though they're going to share in that future, the worst that can happen to you is that you treat them better than they deserve. Whereas if you treat them as, as, as though they are not going to share in that future, then you run the risk of treating them worse than they deserve. And it's the, the second of those is the worst outcome because thereby you, you don't treat someone with the kind of respect that they are owed. So you could imagine someone trying to keep hold of the kind of standard construal of the ideal of neighbor love and its universality while being a non universalist and at the same time adopting the Aquinas' picture of what grounds neighbor love as a practice in this sort of way. 
I appeal to some kind of precautionary principle. <laughs> I don't know why I've got moved myself for what it's worth. I would much rather be a universalist and see <laughs> and push the text in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. Um, time's running out, but I want to firstly just quickly read out a couple of comments, but unfortunately not invite your comment because otherwise <laughs> we'll run out of time. But, but I do want other people to share in them. Um, so Nathan says on this topic that Aquinas thinks that the beatific vision increases as the blessed look, do look down upon those who are eternally condemned, which to him sounds rather horrific. Um, and another comment earlier from John Nightingale saying uh, that there was recently an interesting appreciation of Shirley Williams by David Owen in The Observer. Uh, she had the gift, he said, of making a genuine friendship with anyone, which he appreciated because he did not have that gift. In her case, the crucial quality of her capacity for friendship was not equality, but emp empathy, which I think connects to the original question about, um, about whether we could have friendship in a proper sense with, with Christ. Uh, there are two remaining questions, which for the reasons of time, I'm going to bundle together, although they're on discrete topics, they have some connection. Um, but I invite you to respond to either or both, but I do want both of them to be heard. So the first is from James Arcady, who says, thanks so much. I appreciate the point about alignment with the grand eschatologically oriented story that the Eucharist provides the opportunity for. I wonder about how the alignment takes place within the rite. Is it sufficient to be in the building? Does one need to say all the words? Does one need to consume the consecrated elements? Perhaps the great Amen serves this function, the great Amen being the people's response responsive affirmation which comes uh, which the com which comes at the end of the institution narrative so that's james's question um, and the second is from dean turner who uh, is one of our undergraduates here uh, that was a really interesting lecture thank you your account of aquinas's idea of friendship grounded in a relationship to god reminded me of a passage for where two or three are gathered in my name there i am among them uh, which is matthew 1820 in matthew the idea seems to be that a friendship between believers instantiates a divine presence does this contradict Aquinas' idea that our relationship with God grounds our relationship to other people? Or could we say that the presence of God instantiated by the presence of a community of believers is grounded in the individual believer's personal relationship to God? Do you think this passage has any implication on Aquinas' ideas that friends must gather together bodily or physically? So two different questions, um, but uh, in the remaining couple of minutes, please feel free to comment. Thank or, you. Yeah. Well, thank you, those are both very, Profound questions. Um, so maybe just talking briefly about them. And, um, James, you, if I understand correctly, um, the, the James I'm addressing, you've written a whole book on the Eucharist, maybe several. So I, I'm sure you have a, a very telling response to give the <laughs> questions that you posed. I'm not sure I do. I think, um, yeah, so I talked about the Eucharist bearing two kinds of significance, I think, didn't I? One was to do with the idea that in the Eucharist, the Christian can in some way reckon with their eschatological future engage with it in ways that are appropriate in the present by virtue in some measure of foreshadowing the eschatological future in the present. So that way of representing what's going on, I take it does involve attributing to the individual Christian some kind of appreciation of a distorted context within which they're operating, uh, if they're to recognize that the mode of behavior does indeed constitute a fitting response to that, to the eschatological future so conceived. Um, at the same time, I don't want to give too much of a role mm -hmm. to the idea that the individual has to appropriate relevant stories for their action to bear a certain kind of significance by virtue of their story mm -hmm. setting. Um, in lots of contexts, we could speak of someone's actions as befitting the storied identity of the other person, let's say, or indeed not befitting the storied identity of the other person, even if they're not aware of their story. I think I'd head in those two directions. In some measure, the, the account I've given does invite the thought that if you are to be acknowledging in the fullest sense the eschatological future, then you might actually be a positive situation because it rather matters that you should have to an understanding of the eschatological future, see how, how it is that your actions in the present bear that particular significance. That's a deep and kind of acknowledgement that would be possible if you have no notion, not the right notion at least, of the eschatological future. But at the same time, I don't, I don't want to say that in order for our actions to be Count as appropriate with respect to an individual story identity. It's it's necessary that we should, in each in every case, have an appreciation of that story identity. Very often, I think, of course, we assess the actions of people as more or less appropriate with respect to one story identity, somewhat independently whether they know that story identity. Think of the way which the Greek tragedies work, for example. Maybe the relevant individual may not know the story identity of the Greek tragedies, but actions bear a certain significance, right? Particular significance by virtue of the fact that those individuals have a certain story of identity 
eludes them. The second question from Dean, thank you very much. Um, and I, yeah, I look forward to further exchanges, James. I, mean, I would like. <laughs> I'd like to pick your brains about all these matters concerning the Eucharist at some point. So that's um, and each week, book, that's true. Um, I have read the point. Um, thank you, Dean, very much for that question. I think I just only have to go away and think about that. Um, so it's clearly a fundamental strand of Christian devotional thought to connect. I'm not sure this is quite going to count as an answer to your question, but it's the first thing you'll <laughs> It's a fundamental feature of Christian devotional thought to connect love of God and love of neighbor. Christian perspective, of course, these are the two great commandments which are conjoined in the teaching of Jesus, but also it would make no sense to suppose that you could love God independently of love your neighbor. So there's a fundamental connection between the two. There are various ways of thinking about the nature of that connection. If you think it's Augustine's treatment of the connection with the doctrina Christiana, I take it there, the thought is that it's a count as appropriate our love for other human beings has in some way to be folded into our love for God. So it's not a kind of love that operates independently of love for God. But in some way, an aspect of our love for God. But there'll be different ways of developing the nature of the connection. And clearly, across Christian traditions, there is a God, there is a deep sense of connection. <gasps> so, um, Aquinas provides one way of thinking about the nature of the connection. I take it in the way I described in the course of the lecture that I'm running out of time. <laughs> By virtue of the fact that um, in the eschatological future, we stand in a deep sense relationship of friendship with other human beings and with God, where the second friendship grants the first. That creates an ethical demand upon us at the present. That's obviously what the demon wants to develop, where that ethical demand is forming. Relating to others on the basis kind of a friendship, relating to them on the basis of what Collins calls the friendship of charity. But as you say, there is this interesting text, the Matthew 18 20 text, and you might take that text to invite the thought that maybe things go the other way about rather than beginning with the idea of God's love for us, uh, grounding a relationship of friendship between human beings in the eschatological future, and then coming to think about. Our relations with human beings in the present is properly guided by the idea of friendship. You might instead begin with every day, some of every day, no, well, where two or three are gathered in my name. So already there are <laughs> this particular kind of gathering is, has a kind of theological dimension, of course. There I am present. Um, gosh, so perhaps there may be an easy way out here. I think there's a very interesting question I would like to think about. Then. Maybe we can correspond about it. But I think um, the, the, the straightforward way out of it is to say the text itself invites the thought that this is a mode of encounter that's grounded in, in a, a relationship to God where two or three are gathered in my name. And there I am present. Um, so you, if that's right, and you could take, you too could take Aquinas' account as a kind of elaboration upon what it is for two or three to gather in, in Christ's name. Um, Provide a further spelling out of why it is that certain mode of relationship with other human beings in the present is appropriate if people are gathering in Christ's name, where Christ's significance is spelled out in a kind of way. But that's an, it's an interesting question. I think one of the one of the themes it pushes us towards, I think, Dean, which is a question I want to think further about, and I don't have a satisfactory answer to, is this: you could imagine someone saying there's something not quite right morally about grounding our relations to other human beings in some future truth. I have had this question put to me by Karen Kilby, actually. And I think it's a good question to put. How, how worry is it something slightly out of focus about the significance of other human beings if we want to see their significance as mediated by the set of truths about their future? Surely our relationship to them, I think, is Karen's thought. I'm sorry if I'm misattributing the thought to Karen here. Surely our relationship to them should be just informed by our appreciation of them here and now for their for themselves, independently of this larger narratival context within which we put them. So maybe the, your questions are pushing a bit in that direction, which is an interesting challenge to the kind of perspective I've been developing and I'd like to confirm it about. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we'll thank Mark again in just a moment for his uh, fantastic talk and the really engaging response to those stimulating questions. I also want to thank the audience, uh, both present and especially online, uh, for the questions which enabled that really interesting conversation and also for attending. Uh, we've heard uh, in a very different context about uh, one way of thinking about why it matters to participate collectively in certain sorts of things. So um, thank you for being here and participating with us in this fantastic lecture as part of the series. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And great timing for Mark's folks. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mark, and everybody else. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mark, Could I also say thank you to you, both for the questions and for attending online. Sorry. 
Um, and that was a very helpful question, Rhiannon, about how mo <laughs> we need to elaborate new ways of relating to one another online. I think this occasion shows that it can be done in some significant measure. But I want to, I want to thank you for turning out at this, this rather late hour. Uh, and also, of course, to thank people for being present in person. So thank you very much for taking the trouble to uh, participate, um, both by attending and listening and by putting those very constructive questions, thought provoking questions. And if you, if you have further questions you'd like to put to me, do feel free to email. And again, I want to thank the, 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 the Centre uh, for Global Philosophy of Religion for hosting this occasion and giving me the opportunity to participate. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Mark.